Picking out subjects for sermons is probably one of the more difficult things to do because over the years I felt like what I needed to do in preaching, the first thing was what do I need? The second thing was what do the people in the congregation need? And thirdly, what kind of information can I share that you may not have thought about? And those were the three primary reasons for preaching and bringing a particular lesson. Our lesson today is entitled, Being the Best of the Wrong Things. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about being better at some things that you ought not to be better in, but particularly for young people today, this is something that you need to think about because of the attention that is being drawn away from the very principles of life about Christianity and about Christ, about the church, and that your attention is being drawn away. And sometimes you get to be the best of the wrong kinds of things. When dealing with that, I thought, well, you know, in the Bible, sometimes we've talked about the biggest man who was Goliath. This is Goliath fighting David. And today we're going to talk about the strongest man that is mentioned in the Bible. His name is Samson. He's a very interesting, but also a very disappointing person. He was a judge in Israel, uh, and this meant that he was a spiritual leader. When people had problems, they were to go to him, and he was to help resolve those particular problems. That was the work of a judge. The work of the judge was a spiritual leader of the people of Israel, and sometimes this judge forgot what he was really supposed to be doing. He was a guide. He was a connection to the wisdom of God in the daily lives of those people that he served. Nevertheless, much of what is written about Samson in the Bible has nothing to do with spiritual growth and has nothing to do about growing closer to God, but it does deal with the self-centered life that revolved around his great strength. Now, if, if I was going to brag, you know, I could brag about how slick the top of my head is. And yet I was very good at that because my hair is gone. Now, my uncle is like my grandfather. He had a good head of hair. But my dad, uh, I'm a spitting image, at least from here up, on the outside. And yet, that's not something that you really would go around and brag about. It's not something that I'm even the best at. I've seen others that have had better looking bald heads than what I've got. But sometimes we focus on the wrong things. And I think this is something that Samson was doing. Samson could have used that great strength for the advancement of his people. But he seemed to be more interested in his personal conquest against the Philistines. I didn't know it, but this picture that I chose was almost like the one that we had on the screen just a few minutes ago. Sometimes good minds run in the same direction. Most of the things that we remember about Samson have to deal with his great strength that was given to him by God. And yet, we are going to look at a number of things. Uh, don't write it off as being an old senile preacher, and I forget what I say and say it two or three times during a sermon. But we're going to look at a few things several times in order to make different points, in order to show where Samson went astray. You remember the story about Samson, how that he killed a lion with his bare hands. We also remember that he made a riddle about the carcass and the honey that had come from that. And even on top of that, he lied to his mother and dad about where the honey had come from. We remember that he killed 300 Philistines to fulfill a bet and that he brought the clothing in order to, to provide the answer for that bet that he had made in a, in a riddle. He burned the wheat fields with foxes' tails on fire. Actually, it wasn't their tails. He tied torches to their tails, and the torches set the wheat on fire. We also notice that he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass or a donkey. Quite an accomplishment. 
uh, very interesting uh, weapon that he chose. And uh, we, we, these are things that we remember about Samson. He became enamored with a woman by the name of Delilah. We also remember that he lost his hair and his strength and his eyesight because he finally disclosed the reason why he had great strength. And so when the Philistine man was called to cut off Samson's hair, then he no longer had that great strength. As a result, he became a slave that turned the wine press and they made fun of him because he was just like an ordinary man from that point on. And finally, and the last thing that he did in his life is he tore down the house of Dagon, who was the god of the Philistines, in his death, and he killed many Philistines at that particular time. Samson was a child of promise. This is where our real lesson starts as we think about the background of this great, wonderful, and strong man. His mother had prayed for a child. God heard that prayer, and he granted her petition. But the petition he granted had some, I guess you'd say, subclauses to that because there were some provisions that had to be kept in order for this child to be what God wanted him to be. Part of that was that he, had, he was going to have great strength as long as he did not cut off his hair. This was something that he excelled in, and he excelled in his strength rather than his judging of Israel. He forgot what his real mission in life was. You see, this is part of our problem as children of God. We sometimes get overwhelmed by everything that goes on in life and, and all the pressures that happen to us and, and all the things that are required upon us. And we forget that our mission in life is, first of all, to serve God, to serve Jesus Christ, to be a working portion of the church, and to reach out to bring others into the cause of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we forget that mission. Secondly, Samson was noted for his great strength. We keep repeating, we're repeating this, but it's important to remember that this is where he gets lost in all of this. Uh, we go back to the idea that he killed a lion with his bare hands. In Judges 14, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and he came to the vineyards of Timnah, and suddenly a young roar, lion roared at him. Sometimes that's all it takes. Hey, you! And we've got a fight going, or something's happening. And the lion roared at him, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he tore the lion apart just like might, one might tear apart a, a kid, a, a goat. But he did not tell his mother or his father what he had done. We also notice that he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. I don't know how he did that. I, I don't know how the jawbone lasted, knocking hard-headed Philistines in the head, smacking them around. Maybe two, three, or four, but a thousand? Maybe a little bragged that had gone on there. But the Bible reports and says it was a thousand. That was a pretty good killing. That was something that was really notable. The Bible says in Judges 15, beginning with verse 14, He came to Lehi, and the Philistines came shouting to meet him, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that had caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he reached down, and he took it, and with it he killed a thousand men. Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. And when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and that place was called Ramoth Lehi. What does the jawbone of an ass look like? That's what we have. There's a picture of it. I suppose that he had it by the lower end down here by the the chomping teeth on the end instead of the grinding teeth. Uh, but most of us, we read the scriptures and we've never seen one. You don't know what it is. There it is. Samson also carried off the gates of the city of Giza one time. 
Now you couldn't do that in Oak Ridge because I don't know if we've had any gates. Our gates were closed or opened rather in, back in 1948 or 49. And just recently we celebrated 70 years of that time. So it had to be in, in, 40, in 49. Uh, they weren't carried off. They just took down the barriers. But Samson had gone to spend the night at Gaza and there was a conspiracy to catch him, to kill him. And he woke up in the middle of the night and actually went out and ripped the gates off the, off the walls of the city and carried them off and set them on the top of a hill. And then he taunted the Philistines about it. All the men and women, all the lords of the Philistines were there. On the roof there were about 3,000 men and women and they looked while Samson performed. They had him doing different things to make fun of him. Samson called to the Lord and says, Lord God, remember me and strengthen me only this once, O God, so that with this one act of revenge I may pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one, his left hand on the other, and Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he strained with all of his might, and the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it, so those that he killed at his death were more than those that he had killed during his life. I hope that you have noticed something as we have gone through this story about the remembrance of the things in the life of Samson. Where are the spiritual emphasis? Where is his spiritual leadership? other than the fact that he's, he's a strong man and he is able to do all of these wonderful feats of life and, and the killing of so many of the Philistines who were the enemies of the Jews. We have to remember that sometimes we lose sight of our mission in life. You see, Samson became a disappointment to those people that were around about him people that had looked upon him for guidance, people that had looked upon him as their judge, people who had looked upon him as their spiritual connection to God. One of the things that Samson did was disappointment is he married in opposition to the advice of his parents. The Bible points this out again in the book of Judges. When he came up and told his mother and father, I saw a Philistine woman at Timnah. Now, go and get her for to be my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Isn't there a woman among your kin or among all of your people that you have to go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, You go and get her because she pleases me. Sometimes the beauty of what it is that we're involved with gets us away from the mission in life that we're supposed to have as children of God. Remember that Samson burned the wheat fields of the Philistines using 300 foxes tied together by their tails and then a torch tied to their tails and it was set on fire and I guess if I was a fox and my tail was tied to another fox and fire was on the end of it, I would run like crazy. Wouldn't know what else to do. And yet, sometimes we forget how disastrous this would have been if the wheat was just ready to go and harvest and the fire would have burned it to the ground. In most places when they harvest wheat, a lot of times the straw is left and what they do is they burn those fields to be ready to plant again. The Bible says, Samson said to them, this time when I do mischief to the Philistines, I will be without blame. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes. I don't know how in the world he'd find 300 foxes. They must have been really lots of them around at that particular time. He took torches, he turned the foxes tail to tail, put a torch between each pair of tails and he set fire to the torches and he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines. And he burned up the shocks and the standing grain as well as vineyards and olive groves. 
Do you think that the Philistines would have been upset? Oh, yep, they would have. They were disappointed. And not only were the Philistines disappointed with all of this, but his Jewish neighbors were upset and they turned him over to the Philistines so that they could punish him for doing this. You know, Samson was a judge of Israel for 20 years. But when you look at the book of Judges and you read the stories about Samson, what were his accomplishments in this important area of being a judge of Israel? You don't find anything. It's not there. The Bible never mentions his wise judgments. The Bible shows only his distraction of being vexed with the Philistines and showing off his great strength against them time and time again. He appears to have only his own interest in mind and he tells lies to foster his power and strength in the presence of the Philistines and he lies to his parents, he lies to the Philistines and he lies to Delilah. Isn't that a great thing to be noted for? Sometimes we go wrong and excelling at the wrong things. We begin to excel in things that are not really important or won't last for a long period of time. Maybe some of those things that we mentioned today are some of the things that you've become involved in. What about excelling in sports rather than our regular studies, to be wise and to be prepared for a future job? What about our hobbies taking over rather than our teaching the Word of God? As children of God, that's our responsibility. That's our mission, is to share what we know about Christ and about the church and about the Bible and about God to those people that are around about us. And how about spending more time on our personal health rather than our spiritual health? Maybe we need Bible Pilates and yoga. I don't know if they exist, but that's a possibility. How about reading more magazines and books for pleasure than reading God's Word? How much time do you spend reading God's Word? How much time do you spend reading comic books? Well, the big things, all these uh, Avengers and all the, the uh, X-Men and all of these other things are, are the, the big thing of today. Do we spend more time doing that and, and reading other books rather than reading God's Word that will make us wise for eternity? How about spending more time playing video games than preparing our Bible lessons? My, preachers quit preaching and gone to meddling. Are we more physically fit like Samson than we are spiritually fit like Jesus? which will benefit us the most and the longest in life. Samson was a well-known person of Old Testament, but he was not noted for some of the best things of life. He was physically strong, but he seemed to be lacking in the spiritual realm. That happens to us today. You know, members of the church used to be known as the Bible-toting, Bible-quoting people. Now, I, I know that you have your Bible on your phone, and I know that you have your Bible on your tablet, and I know you have your Bible on your computer. But do you carry one with you when you go out and visit folks, and you talk to folks, and you try to share with them about the Word of God? Nothing is noted in Samson's life about being a good or even a great spiritual leader. Sometimes our emphasis is only upon the material things of life, and that happens with churches as well as it happens with us as individuals. And sometimes we're more important. We think the most important thing is, is to have X amount of money or that we are spending money on things that we shouldn't. If it's 
a good spiritual exercise and it's good for teaching folks the Word of God, then we need to be doing it. We need to be careful in our lives that we do not excel in the things of life that really don't amount to much. And we need to be more like Jesus and excel in all phases of life, but especially those of the spiritual side. One verse in the scriptures that should always be in our minds is one written about Jesus found in Luke 2 and verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus increased in what he could know. Jesus increased in what he could be. And Jesus increased with his relationship with God and also the people that were round about him. But note what comes last. Today, our young people sometimes are just terrified by the fact that maybe somebody won't like them or won't, uh, what is it you do on the, on the social, that you get a like and you get 400,000 of those, the people that you've never seen, don't know, doesn't make any difference whether you do or not. What about the people that are sitting beside you, sitting behind you, sitting in front of you, sitting on either side of you here at church, at school, at other places that are found in our community? It was Paul who wrote to the young preacher Timothy these words in 1 Timothy 4. He said, Bodily exercise profits for a little while, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially to those that believe. Now these things command and teach, and let no man despise your youth, but you be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity or love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. The whole point of this lesson is that you be not like Samson. And ask yourselves, are you the best in the right things or the wrong things of life? That makes this a lesson for each and every one of us because we can become so enamored with other things in life other than serving God and serving Jesus Christ and serving our fellow man. Maybe you need to make some changes today. Mark leads us in this song in just a moment. It'd be an opportunity for us to say, I want to change things in my life. I want to be different from what I've been. I want to center on the things that I should center upon. I want to be the best of the best things of life, not the worst things of life. So, if you need to respond to the invitation this morning, would you come while we stand and sing?